everyone. On behalf of the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage Intact and the Indian Intact Conservation Institute, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Her Bessie Cecil, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Ruila, Director, ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Bessie Cecil is an alumnus of College of Arts and Crafts, Chennai and has obtained a PhD in textile design and textile conservation from the University of Madras in 2010. Now she is a devoted textile researcher who gained knowledge through various research fellowships over the years. To briefly let you tell you the list, she was a visiting fellow at Victoria and Albert Museum London on Nehru Fellowship in 2006, Fulbright Doctoral and Professional Fellow at the Florida State University, USA in in 2006 7 and research associate at the craft education research center kalakshetra foundation in 2007 and 8 uh, chennai during which the prime focus was exploration with natural dyes and creating designs as a research fellow at ancient civilizations museum singapore she researched on hand painted techniques and dye analysis of the trade textiles from the Coromandel coast to South Asia in 2010 11. She has curated the exhibitions uh, Batik Sutra, Pago Travel and Textiles, organized by Sutra Textile Studios, Kolkata in 2011, and Colors of Nature, again organized by Sutra Textile Studios and Botanical Survey of India, Kolkata in 2014, and also conceptualized exhibition catalogs on natural dyes, Destination India, and Batik Sutra. Ago travel and textiles. Her association with Intac, of course, she's been part of our textile conservation work, workshop in 2012. Later, she was awarded the research fellow Intac, New Delhi, 2015 and 16. And she was also a Charles Wallace fellow to UK in 2015. She's presently working as researcher on a book, Weaving India, focusing on handloom textile tradition and working as consultant handlooms at the Crafts Education Research Center, Kalakshetra Foundation, Chennai. Now the title for today's talk is Red, Blue and Cotton, Elapsed History of Natural Dyes and Indigenous Cotton Fabric. The red, blue and are the dominant, the red and blue are the dominant natural dyes on indigenous hand spun and hand woven cotton fabric. The popular discussion mostly has been on natural dyes, but never on the combination of natural dyes and the base fabric. That is the variety that of cotton fibers that can be created. This presentation will discuss the varied aspects of painted and printed textiles created from the Coromandel Coast that are housed in museums across the world. Before I invite Bessie, I of course request all of you to put your microphones on mute so that we can all hear the talk properly. And please type in your name, your organization name, and the email ID in the chat box facility. Also, please type in any questions that you may have as the talk goes on in the same chat box. We'll be taking those up at the end of the talk. So I now invite Bessie to start with the presentation. Thank you, Bessie. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Padma. And uh, good evening, everybody from India. Again, greetings from India, from Chennai. And uh, presentation, I have to confess, presentation always puts me on a nervous mode. You know, I have a major starting trouble, but hopefully I should get over it within a few seconds or a minute. So give me that time. And um, yeah, today's topic, as you read on the screen, it's a red, blue, and cotton. And uh, in this presentation, there are limitations. I'm not going to be or going in depth into the subject. Reason one, I am not a chemist or a botanist, but this presentation is going to be more of a narrative or my journey, how I discovered uh, whatever I'm going to be presenting today. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, I don't see anybody's faces, so presenting, talking in front of the my own image, it, it, it's so difficult for me anyway. I'm going to try and do my best. Kindly bear with me if there's any shortcoming or, you know, uh, uh, and um, yeah, if I'm going to be stammering or taking a pause, yeah, kindly bear with me. I'm getting used to the new normal and here I am. Okay, again, the topic red, blue and cotton. You know, I wanted a topic 
or a title. Am I audible? Am I clear? Yes, Bessie, we can all hear you clearly. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, now and then, uh, uh, you know, feedback really helps me anyway. And uh, uh, red, blue, I wanted basically to be really catchy. And I was very happy when this title came to my mind. Um, the topic is going to be focusing on the natural dye ray. And you see elapsed history of natural dyes. Let's focus on that first. So what do I mean by red and blue and the, the elapsed history of natural dyes? When you see that, I'm going to go to the next slide. It's a closer, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, version of the previous slide. And here you see more of, it's just the ground, then you see the blue, then you see the red. And this textile, and I have acknowledged where these textiles are from. So, you know, for your future reference, you can always go or, and, uh, for, you know, further study or research or anything. So in the combination is this, the whole story, the, the journey of my red or blue started with this textile. This textile is called Karupur or Kodali Karupur, popularly known as, uh, this is like, you know, during the Tanjavur Marathas in South India, this unique textile came to be very famous and it was over for the uh, Kings of the palace, queens or the kings for the palace who were there in the Tanjavur. And this museum, this particular tradition is not open anymore. We, we cannot, we do not have craftspeople or the dye that the red you see in that. We do not, we have lost the knowledge of dyeing this particular red. And uh, my PhD or my, uh, let, let, let me start from there. My PhD topic was on this particular textile. It's uh, like I mentioned, it's called Karupur, Kodali Karupur. It's a name of a village rather than a technique. In, in India, the popular, uh, you know, the, any textile for Kanjivram or Banaras, every, most of the textiles, it takes the name of the place where it is owned rather than having its own technical name. And here Karupur also, it's the name of the village where it is owned. And here you see it is basically the technique is resist. I will not go into all that, but let's focus on the color red. So when I uh, registered for my PhD, when I started, this was the textile. And the red, the red was a big question. I was asked to do the dye analysis. And I'm, I'm uh, skipping majority of the, you know, journey. I'm just focusing because the given time, I just wanted to be short and precise to the point. So anybody have any question, you can get in touch with me later. But here, uh, let me continue with where I left. And uh, the focus was on red. And where did this red come from? From conservation point of view. My, uh, I was attached to the government museum that of Chennai, uh, Chemical Conservation uh, and Research Laboratory. And uh, I was asked to do dye analysis. You, when, when I said my limitations, I'm an artist. I'm not a science person. I'm not a botanist. I'm nobody. I'm just an artist. So, you know, for me, the word dye analysis comes with a major hit. I, I was completely lost. How do I do it? So they, of course, you do the literature survey. Uh, but from the, uh, for, uh, for, you, you come to understand this is a period textile, which is 18th or 19th century. At that point of time, there is no uh, synthetic dyes. And naturally, the source is natural. So what are the sources? So when I went into the literature survey, I was able to identify a few of the sources, the plants. One is, the, these are the botanical names. Uh, Oldenlandia ambulata, Rubia cordifolia, Morinda citrifolia, Cecilpenia sapen, Ventilago madrasa patana. And then you have the lac. And the plant which you see, Oldenlandia ambulata, popularly known as the che root. And this was the, this reference I came across uh, multiple times. And wow, I, I, uh, multiple times, but you know, we had no knowledge of how this plant looks or, um, and you know, basically it was uh, for my dye analysis. Coming back to this, I have to do the dye analysis. So how do I do the dye analysis? Of course, first the literature survey, then next collection of the plant. So but now, where do I collect the plant from? We have popular country shops here where they sell natural dye material or natural material for medicinal purpose, for other purposes as well, for puja purposes, that is, um, and uh, various other purposes. They, they, they sell these material, the, the plants and, you know, 
the uh, plant source medicinal plants that's what they sell and a natural dye uh, dye yielding plant is one group and here i go and i ask for plant a plant b plant c you know for all the plant i ask and every plant it you know it comes in the dried form so you don't it may be the part of the leaf or a stem or a root you you ask and you will get it so i was getting i purchased it and then the dye analysis happened for red you know what all this popular dyes never gave me the results i was very upset for my phd i didn't have the results none of the plants uh, showed the result where we dye extracted the dye from the actual sample and the standards that we prepared i was not able to get it so the question mark was what happened where is the plant and that is when i had an opportunity you know by then i was awarded i i, I presented as it is that i didn't give results it didn't get results but i was awarded my phd for the work that i had done and uh, you know over uh, the 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 title dr bessie sissel doesn't you know make you happy what makes you happy is results so you know the, my uh, my uh, search or my quest kept on it was back of my mind you know where did i go wrong then it occurred to me maybe you know the shops where they sell they are going to be giving anything you ask so, you know local terms differ for so point one is that and anything and everything you ask they will definitely give because somewhere so they'll go this discuss oh they somebody is asking for chai plant no chai ver or chai root or they'll say okay this is the plant you give it you know that's how it happens so you do not have the actual plant to verify is it from that particular plant you're given something in your hand to go do your analysis so uh, first uh, thing that started you know first thing which i did was when the, in the year 2011 or i think 10 uh, the textile sutra studies they had this exhib exhibition in uh, calcutta and i went to botanical survey of india and uh, that is when i wanted to understand how does the plant look the olden landia amblata and there from the herbarium i was able to understand what the plant was and the distribution of the plant the next step was coming here to uh, south india we have the botanical uh, of survey of india the coimbatore chapter so i went to coimbatore and there i was able to get the people's help and you know with the uh, knowledgeable botanist i went into the field and collected all the five plants which is said above i'm not going to be talking about lac lac is and uh, you know it's from the insect but uh, whatever was used in you know, majorly whatever uh, uh, dyes that were used at one point of time on cotton uh, was plant source and not from the animal or uh, any other source so uh, going there i was able to collect all the sample and that is the time when i got the next or uh, next opportunity to do my a uh, uh, study or research on textiles that were traded from coromandel coast to southeast asia which is there in asian civilizations museum collection that was an eye opener for me and that is when we decided or uh, to do uh, the museum decided to do the analysis dye analysis particularly red on 14 of the textiles and here coming back each and like i said we're having a tie up with the botanical survey of india was able to collect all the plants and we did the analysis uh, and uh, the uh, standards the the dye was extracted from the historical textiles the standards were prepared and these were sent to japan for further analysis and out of 14 11 were olden landia ambulata so what happened to this olden landia ambulata and why it is not known today or you know as it should be this is the plant i'm talking about and this is recorded as it should be known well at one point it was so popular it was so you know it it captured it, it was the plant for the red uh, dye from the coromandel coast and what happened to this and in in the early one of the earliest uh, earlier re earliest record is the plants of coromandel coast by william roxburgh 1795 he has very clearly given this, this is available the whole the book is available uh, online so anybody can free download it just uh, you know copy the uh, the uh, uh, caption which i have given and type it you will have the whole free download you will have it the whole dying process 
using this plant it's not only the dying process but the cultivation the period where it was grown how it was grown and every detail is given there this is a very small plant where you will you know this is when i was looking all around for this plant and i never realized every day i stamp that plant you know before i venture out into my daily chores i have to step onto this plants and go i never realized until i saw with the botanical survey of india and i you know they showed me the plant and this grows everywhere the point is it grows everywhere but they are so small but the root is so deep and so strong the root bark is used for the dyeing and at one point when uh, the uh, the first synthetic dye was uh, that was introduced was alizarin which is the uh, component in this uh, uh, you know root bark that yields red and the synthetic alizarin was first uh, introduced or you know or discovered in the year 1868 this was the first dye and uh, soon after slowly you know these these came into the market slowly replacing the uh, olden landia ambulata and i have to tell what are the other plants you know at one point with olden landia ambulata they mixed the rubia cordifolia because the olden landia ambulata was the or the chair root was an expensive uh, uh, plant meaning you know raw material so they often mixed it with the uh, rubia cordifolia and why morinda citrifolia morinda citrifolia is used in most of the part from orissa and the upper region and other area of the uh, other region of the country and the sisalpenia sapen it doesn't have fastness but it often it is used as a primary when the first uh, step of dyeing you know and one more thing you have to understand technically it is not one dye bath it's dipped and we have taken okay i've got the color it's not like that there are there have been multiple process so the initial process is sisalpenia sapen is used but at a very later period i see at the probably you know a late um, uh, 20th on no, only late 98 19th century i see use of ventilago but not much of reference but it also coincides you know it also seem to uh, yield red dye i haven't done uh, you know one more thing that you have to understand when i said we uh, i took all this plant and collect we you know collected all this plant and try to dye the cotton here none of the uh, plants gave red i didn't know why but uh, you know this was really heartbreaking uh, but i never understood but i thought i was wrong and then at one point i resorted maybe the quality of the water changed that is why i didn't get the results however when we took it for the analysis the chemical composition was right so with the asian civilizations museum samples we were able to get the results but uh, bear in mind i didn't get the colors and uh, again this you know the next point was why i didn't get the color you know that kept nagging and it kept nagging but i never had the answer and i really didn't you know i didn't have the opportunity or to uh, uh, approach any institution or any individual because i didn't have that kind of a funding and i wasn't attached to any institution for me to carry out the analysis all by myself however i met few of the uh, people who have been researching in the field Uh, one is the murugappa chettiar research center which is there in chennai and the other one is uh, velur institute of technology where dr shiva has been uh, working on it so there are few uh, you know it, it's not full fledged but i have been trying to understand what is this you know uh, what is the chemistry that really went into fixing the uh, okay. dye onto the cotton i think i think i was shanda dal me i think anybody have any question i will tell you I'll ask them to mute. You carry on, but see no questions. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, the, so with the introduction of the aniline dyes, that is the alizarin, this uh, the, the natural red came to a complete. Eventually, slowly, it came to completely came to a halt. Earlier, this is a wheat plant. It was majorly cultivated. and uh, that cultivation came to a stop like i said it was repeated process and the process take months together it's not uh, uh, you know days sometimes it's months together and where particularly when it rains again the dyeing cannot happen and uh, yeah I, i'm kind of <laughs> okay the dyeing cannot happen 
and uh, he, uh, one of uh, a scholar from uh, Columbia University, he was doing uh, research in uh, Sri Lanka, came across a particular community called Veerkuti. And apparently, these Veerkuti community were Che root diggers. You know, Veerkuti means root diggers. And these people were, uh, you know, put in a camp, particularly, or you can say, you know, in Sri Lanka, there's no slavery, slavery as such, you don't see it. But this particular Veerkutis were support, were not given much of the privilege to education and other stuff. It's a it's a completely a different subject, but the the extent of this plant that was cultivated came to you know complete uh, what do you say we don't have the knowledge we we, we of we don't know what is a plant we lost the art of dying and uh, we don't have an opportunity to see the textiles that were actually dyed with these plants but apparently all the textiles were traded. And they are safe in, you know, families, probably in Southeast Asia with the families, they really preserved it for ages. And eventually most of the collection has come, I mean, uh, those, uh, those, those uh, textiles that were highly revered had come into the museum collection. Uh, not to, and, uh, the, uh, and, and the later point is the popular term chins and those you will see in many of the museums across the world. And this is what the actual red which gave yielded the red uh, rich uh, red the scenario the current scenario is this. so what is uh, happening now now at present this red we are trying to revive again and it is going to be a long journey and this revival you know uh, like I said, earlier i mentioned it is the quality of water but uh, in the process, I came to understand it is not only the quality of water, but maybe, maybe the quality of the yarn, that is the cotton. So before I go to cotton, I would like to briefly talk about the uh, blue, that is the indigo blue, and then I would go on to the cotton. So hold on, just we'll connect it, uh, you know, we'll finish the blue and we'll go to the cotton and we'll put everything together. And here we have the blue. Everybody knows blue, uh, most of us know blue is from indigo. And there are a number of species. And this is one uh, slide. What you see is from the Thomas Wardle uh, uh, report on dyes and tans of India, which is the only surviving set which with the industrial section, Botanical Survey of India, Calcutta. And uh, here, more, what you see is wool and silk, but uh, it's not cotton. But, you know, I just wanted to. Oh, uh, bring to your uh, notice that about the Thomas Wardle and his work on natural dyes. That is why I put the slide here particularly. And this is the plant uh, that yield Indigofera tinctoria in South. This is a popular plant that is used. There are other species also. I am not going to go into that and I'm not a botanist. So I don't have an authority to speak on that particular subject. But this is the uh, uh, you know variety that has been widely used. And here in Dindivanam, if you all want more information about how it has been cultivated, this is one living tradition. Thankfully, it does not die. We have around uh, from Chennai, 100 kilometers down south, we have a place called Dindivanam where 1,000 acres of land has been cultivated and dye has been extracted and uh, the dyeing has been done actively in South, I can say, Auroville, Colors of Nature, where it has been done. So I'm not going to be focusing much on this. So whenever you come back, any, any questions, anything, you can come back. The technique of dyeing and all that, if you need, you please email to me. We will. Uh, I, I can share the information, whatever I have. And uh, this is... The, uh, so this is what the blue, it is a living tradition. So you have a lot of information and I can share with that. And now I move on to cotton. So this is, this is a, the slide what you see here is from the Watson volume. This was uh, published in the year 1867 and this is from the Victorian Albert collection. And uh, we do have uh, in Chennai, in India also, we have few uh, volumes that are there. This is uh, out of, I, I want to say here, it's 15 volumes and around 3,000 dyed samples with various uh, dye yielding plants across the country is being documented. But major of the, and this uh, dye raw material was exported from uh, uh, India to uh, uh, England where uh, Thomas Wardle in his laboratory or in his factory, he uh, dyed with cotton, uh, silk, 
not cotton, sorry, silk and wool, majorly silk and wool. Cotton, he was not very successful. There is one, no, one page of yarns. You see the dyeing quality, you know, he was not able to fix the uh, uh, dye onto this cotton yarn. And, uh, but whereas in cotton, uh, whereas in silk and wool, the dye is very vibrant. And even today, it looks, you know, as if it is dyed uh, hours before. And uh, this is the second volume, which I would like to say. This is, and many of you all are aware of it, but then the 700 samples that Thomas Wardle had put in 18 volumes is the record of, you know, the period textiles that happened. Here you see the, the textile is from RNE, it says Madras. You know, this is muslin. It says muslin RNE from Madras. Today, we have no knowledge of this kind of cotton this kind of RNA is not very far, it's 100 kilometers from Chennai again towards the east of this. And um, this, we, and the, we do not have, until I saw this, I didn't know, you know, this, the, this kind of muslin was woven or, you know, uh, this kind of uh, fabric existed in South India until I saw this. And so what happened to this cotton that was, you know, once very popular, that had a particular kind of uh, uh, property? And uh, what, what happened to all this? So we, we all know, <coughs> we all are aware there is so much, uh, so much of uh, hybrid variety being introduced. And uh, what is the scenario uh, that happened? Oh, one scenario, the one, one, the, the multiple, multiple factors uh, contribute to the change of the scenario. One is the, uh, the spinning jenny or, you know, the, the way uh, spinning of the cotton was mechanized. The property, there was a compromise with the property. The introduction of the uh, chemical or synthetic dye, there was a... No major compromise on the dye quality or you know the technical the techniques that we lost. The third one is the hybrid varieties or uh, the genetically modified varieties that were introduced. So what happened? What cotton do we have now? The majority of the cotton that we cultivate today in our country is all genetically modified uh, hybrid varieties, and the popular term is the American uh, cotton variety. That's what it is said. And these are long staple cotton. And I'm, again, uh, there are varieties of staple. Uh, this is the cotton plant. This is, uh, one is a cotton tree and one is a cotton plant. This, this is the indigenous variety that has been documented uh, by William Roxburgh and other botanists. And the tree is he said to grow uh, almost six feet and you know more and these trees these native variety cottons are perennial perennial meaning throughout the year they i mean uh, they grow they yield and uh, they don't uh, and th they are rain fed we and so you know we needn't have to water but whereas the cotton which are being cultivated today you need a lot of uh, they need a lot of fertilizer and it has to be watered and uh, what happens when you use fertilizer? The depletion of the nutrients of the soil. And uh, we don't, we know it, where, where the crop is rain fed, when you're going to be watering and the cost that is incurred. And it's not about not only the cost, but the, uh, the after effects, meaning the pollutants that are, uh, uh, that comes into play as well. And eventually of all, the heritage has been replaced. What happens is there are long staple cotton, there are a short staple, medium staple, and some extra long staple cotton. And the cotton, what India had was all short staple cotton. What happens there is a few millimeters, five to seven millimeters, you know, eight millimeters. And these are completely, uh, and processing these yarn is very difficult. What happened when the spinning was, uh, the mechanized spinning was introduced, Spinning with short staple was becoming very difficult. Slowly, the uh, the the variety, the foreign variety, you know, entered, and they start. They were cultivated because India had the best uh, soil condition and uh, the colony and uh, the cheap labor. Everything facilitated. You no, know, the replacement of the variety was much easier, 
uh, then making a machine that was suitable for the fiber which was very popular which had superior quality or the property uh, the uh, 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 the long staple cotton was introduced which is what is majorly used now and this cotton probably had better affinity towards the natural dye than uh, the variety which you know we have been trying see but when uh, i am going to be showing this this is something which i want th these are well, probably few minutes uh, of i have five slides Put together, it will take six minutes. I'm going to be briefly explaining what it is, what is the process, and what is the property we are losing when everything is mechanized. And this is one place called Ponduru. It, it is 100 kilometers from Visagapatanam, and uh, where everything, the pre-spinning process as well as the pre-spinning and the weaving, everything is done by hand. What happens? The quality, the qual and it is the native variety cotton. The cotton which has been over here, this is a case study which I am presenting here. This cotton is called Arapati or Kondapati. There are two varieties, which is the hill cotton or the red cotton. So here I am going to be playing this uh, short video. Uh, I have a look and I will come back again. Okay, uh, this is a process where they are combing. You know, there, there is a, 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 she uses a, the jaw bone of a fish, a catfish variety called Balaga fish, which is caught in the river, a uh, river which is uh, like 100 kilometers from their place uh, called Godavari. It's a, 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 one of the major rivers of the country. And this variety of fish has the, you know, has a jawbone, and you see number of tiny teeth, hundreds of tiny teeth. So they basically break the jawbone and they fix a wooden handle to it, and they comb it. Why do they do it? Because the 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 it's a short staple uh, cotton, and uh, the lint is so small, and it is very fuzzy closer to the seed. So when you are going to do, you know, put into the roller or when you are going to press, the seed is not going to come. So they have to do this process where they comb it and uh, they uh, basically uh, straighten out the, you know, relax the fussiness around the seed. Once that is done, the next process is removing the seeds. So that was removing the uh, seeds. And the next thing what they do is carding. Basically, they, it removes the impurities and all the fiber uh, come in, you know, are kind of aligned. And there's one more process where they use two sticks to, you know, they keep beating where they form, uh, form a parallel, the fibers are pa parallel. And the next process is sliver making. Yeah, and the, that is sliver making. 
And uh, before I go into this video, and uh, that is the process, uh, you know, the, uh, the beauty is uh, everything is done by hand. So the cotton basically doesn't lose its property, which is uh, very important. Today's uh, scenario, the cotton is uh, cultivated in an area, you, we, it is harvested mechanically, it is baled immediately so that the transportation is e easier. So one, it goes to the ginning mill, it is opened by using a you know, teeth saw kind of a thing where it rolls the property, it loses its elasticity um, and uh, it, there is so much of damage that's being done. And once that is done, again, it is blown with hot air. So its capacity to observe the, you know, or breathe reduces. But here, everything is done uh, manually. And uh, 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 in that case, the cotton retain, the fiber doesn't lose any of its property, which is so important and which has been the key factor uh, when you see the historical textiles where it has even the color or if it has been so sturdy and if it has survived this many years, be it color, be it the fabric, it's because, because of the cotton, the quality of the cotton that's been used. Here, um, you know, the cotton uh, carded or, you know, the, the, the pre-spinning process, what you saw, the, this is the spinning this is how it, it, the yarn is spun. Uh, you see, uh, she is holding, uh, you know, in her uh, left hand the uh, sliver, and the sliver is kept within a dried uh, palm leaf, so that you know you don't transfer your the oil from your hand or any dirt. And that is how it is done. This is this is the practice which is there in Punduru now, and uh, the earliest light. Prior to, you know, that is called the charka or the uh, spinning wheel. Uh, here, this is uh, uh, prior to the charka method, drop spindle was used for spinning. And this is how it is being done. And this is the cotton from Nagaland. And I haven't done the study on what variety of cotton it is, but they don't have the process of, you know, combing. They directly take the uh, cotton, you see what she's doing, and she's removing the uh, seeds from the cotton. And uh, she's spinning. Of course, there is carding that they do it. So what happens next is weaving. So once the yarn is ready, but there is a process in between process, what happens the, uh, uh, to the yarn before it comes to the loom as warp and wet. So that technicality, I'm not going to be focusing, but they are basically hand woven and the looms are very simple. They are, they're called the pit loom where the weaver literally sits inside, you know, uh, where uh, his, uh, from the torso, he's, inside a pit and it is the yarn are kept closer to the ground because uh, these yarn will retain the moisture in that case it doesn't break and um, so this is how it was woven all the fine muslins or majority of the cloth was woven at one point of time we have lost majority of the tradition and tradition or the techniques and that it in some pockets, there are some, you know, some uh, indigenous practices are happening, but uh, before it's too late, those have to be preserved and documented. And uh, this is for you to just give an idea. This is not Konduru or uh, anywhere. This is a different place. But this is how usually the traditional uh, looms are. They don't have a solid frame. It is just hung from a tree where they're sitting under the tree and weaving. So it, didn't, it doesn't have a need a particular kind of setup. It can be fixed anywhere and any uh, anyhow when they start weaving. 
and uh, um, uh, Padma? Yes. Yeah, uh, is, is it okay? Am I clear? Yeah, yeah, everything is clear, Bessie. I'll let you know in case there's a problem with the audio. Please carry okay. on. Okay, okay. So the, this is a brief thing which I presented about cotton and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So uh, I'll, I'll run through, the next section will be, I'll be running through a few textiles where uh, re, the, I'll be talking, you, you know, uh, well, just to give a brief idea on what are the techniques and how historically blue and red has been majorly used. I'll be showing just a few textiles and I'll, I'll discuss along, uh, you know, as and when I'll be showing it. The textile which you see here with the dot, 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 which is the tie-dye technique, you know, this was basically done in Madurai. Madurai is a, a temple town in South India where the red is completely different. I don't know how it is done. I have got two references to it. I, I, I'm, they uh, use a local term to record the plant. So if I go now and I was trying to understand what that plant is, locals don't have an idea what plant. And botanically, you know, like how uh, uh, Will, uh, William Roxburgh had done the work on this particular uh, plant or, you know, uh, the but the work it, it has not been documented so it is a research uh, which is yet to be carried out but it's completely a different rate it is also said at one point of time uh, the uh, the tie dye from Gujarat they used to dye tie the bani comes for dyeing to Madurai because the red is so rich and the Vaige river the water the, the quality of the water from that river gave a rich red. And uh, this is a completely, again, a lost uh, technique and uh, this has to be researched upon. And uh, so this is the tie-dye technique and this is just uh, oven. And uh, again, here is a fine muslin where it's been embroidered. And uh, here again, oh, sorry. Uh, red using an interlock technique. It's all from Forbes Watts, Watson. I have taken it. And here is another interesting textile uh, from the ACM collection, A Asian Civilizations Museum. Uh, see, when uh, the popular term chins, you all are aware of, you know, when it comes to painted textile, everybody's, uh, in everybody's mind, the term that comes is the chins and next is Kalamkari. This is nothing to do with Kalamkari. I have to be very clear. None of the textiles, what I'm going to be showing here, has got nothing to Kalamkari. Kalamkari is a popular term. Uh, that evolved in 1950s. So well, according to the literature, 1903, I see the word reference as Kalamdar. Otherwise, it is just painted textiles. But earlier in uh, one of the journals, uh, I find the reference, Nir Elithu. Nir Elithu means uh, writing in water, writing or to paint with water because the consistency of the dye is so watery. That is our local term. Nir elithu. Melugu elithu means the other term which they have used is melugu elithu. That is melugu means wax. Elithu means to write or to paint. So the two terms, the local terms have been used. And I, so please don't confuse any of these textiles with Kalamkari. Oh, and here, this, and there is, if you refer the book uh, Chins, there is one particular report that um, uh, Mrs. Rosemary Krill would have incorporated about the painting techniques of the chins. Uh, see, that is one method. But when you see the textiles, you know, well, it depends on what color dominates or what is the kind of design. Every textile is a different technique. For example, this is a different technique. This is a different technique. And here, this one is different. You know, to, these are two textiles in one slide. They both are done in a different method. And this is different. Uh, so, yeah, so it is all, every, everything is, uh, every textile is done in a different technique. Uh, one particular technique doesn't apply to every uh, textile or every uh, uh, chins or every painted textile. And uh, here you see the majority of the color is indigo. So naturally, indigo is dyed here. But the next slide here, not necessarily the indigo should have been dyed. It could have, it is painted here. So this is the, and here again, here, uh, one slide you see uh, there is so, the, the blue is kind of 
in small, 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 it's kind of, uh, uh, what do you say? What well, you have an effect there, but uh, the, the other one uh, doesn't have an effect. So both are different techniques. So here the one uh, tech, uh, textile, they have used resist. The other one, they have not used resist. Uh, that is the wax resist. Here again, they have used resist and they have dyed and blue has been painted. And here again, it is the say here there is you don't see blue, but there is yellow and uh, the darker version of the uh, uh, you know red, which is purplish uh, maroonish it is. And here it is an interesting uh, piece of chins again. You don't see black at all. There is no use of black. But if you see the literature, that at least the literature that is available with us, it always starts with black. So I, I, I strongly feel these textiles were made prior to you know, the era when it was documented or for some reason, uh, you know, textile particularly uh, these uh, were uh, traded to Southeast Asia. There is no black at all. Probably some auspicious, you know, something to do with the color black. For some reason, they have not used black at all. It is not only here textiles that were traded from Gujarat to Southeast Asia also. You don't see it and you see much of it's block print. It's a combination of block print and hand painted. You don't see uh, uh, black at all. The majority of them, at least one period, you know, period uh, textile, you can see that you can say there's no use of black at all. And uh, here, I, there they have achieved many shades by repeated dyeing. And this is uh, again a technique that we have lost. And uh, now we are in Kalakshetra, we're trying to revive it. It is not easy as it is, you know, uh, I am saying here. I don't know how many months or years it's going to take because we have lost the crafts. It's not only the dyeing knowledge that we lost, but the fine craftsmanship of using the wax resist. We have lost it today. Batik, uh, the popularly known batik, the, uh, uh, the craft was learned, you know, went from Coromandel Coast to Southeast Asia. They have mastered it. The one reason, you know, they, they had to master it because they, they revered the textile. And it was so important when the trade came to you know slow halt, it's better they had to come out with their own textile. So it, it, good it survived there. But whereas it was majorly used as a trade textile, there was I don't I don't know if there was local consumption because none of the museums, at least in Chennai or the South region, we don't have such textiles in our collection. We do have few later period, um, uh, say 19th, uh, 18th, uh, no, 20th century, you know, 19th century uh, kalam karis we have, uh, but not such uh, painted text. Else we do not have it in our collection. And this is yet another you know, close-up of Tree of Life. And you see the, uh, the texture of the cotton is visible here. And uh, here, this is my last slide for today. And this is one of the very interesting uh, you know, piece where it, it's not visible, but when you see the textile, the background is completely of blue. Uh, they have uh, done a pattern using, uh, uh, you know, it's blue, but they have applied the resist. So it's all small, 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 small checks evenly distributed throughout. It's one of the most beautiful uh, textile in the collection. And even um, Shilpa Shah has a similar collection with them. That is the Garden Vareli. And uh, yeah, with this, I would like to, uh, you know, conclude my uh, presentation. And before... Before I conclude, I would like to acknowledge a few of the institution, Craft Education and Research Center, where I'm currently, uh, you know, a, a consultant. But prior to that, few years, 10 years back, I was there as a research fellow. Asian Civilizations Museum, where I did my research and my major of the collection, which I showed you, is from their uh, collection. And Victoria and Albert Museum, because Watson volume I've taken. Uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the first textile, what I showed, the Karupur is from them. Sutra textile, textile Studies, they shared the information, of course, the Botanical Survey of India and Intag New Delhi for giving me this opportunity. I have a whole lot of individuals and institutions to thank. But in this slide, I'm just chosen a few uh, which was relevant, you know, which I had used for this presentation. Uh, so I thank you very much and thank you, Padma. And, uh, yeah, I'm ready for questioning and anything for discussion. Thanks, Basil. I think it was a very nice presentation.
Uh, we have a few questions. One is uh, from uh, Denicia Fernandez. She is saying, is there any kind of help that we can help you in preserving the techniques that are on the brink of being lost? Uh, maybe she means any way we can, they can associate probably in the process. Uh, she's asking that. First question. Yes. Is there any way uh, you know, it is more than the textile. I would be uh, worried about the, the uh, art of spinning that is dying. See, uh, I went uh, to, uh, you know, that is the only place for all I see, a superior variety of cotton is being woven, that is Ponduru. Here, uh, the spinners, the hand spinners, or, uh, you know, it is fast dying. And there are a handful of people, and these textiles are very, exp meaning expensive for Indian uh, market, they are expensive. They are like uh, one meter is 1,200 rupees, which is a plain fabric, which is supposed to be expensive. But for me, I feel this is country's heritage. This, uh, see, today's Kadi, like, today's Kadi is majorly, uh, what I understood in my research journey is the kinds of yarn. First, uh, what has been done in Punduru is the way it was all done earlier. The popular belief is the Kadi is all done by hand, no majority till the sliver making it is all mechanized only the spinning is done with new amber charka which is again semi mechanized you have to understand that so what tag does a complete handmade has today we do not have an answer to that and next what kadi was what we saw what i showed it was like that it is completely taken a shift and the next what we use today is completely American variety cotton. It's completely mill made and it is hand woven. So what are, uh, what is, you know, I don't know what I should be saving here. The cotton variety, because many of the species are lost. So one is to preserve. There, so there are a few individuals across the country has come up like uh, in uh, Kala cotton in Gujarat and uh, Jaydar in Karnataka, Karunguni in uh, South India and Upamparati in South India, Erapati and Kondapati in Andhra and in, uh, in uh, Nagaland there is a variety. I don't know the name, like I said. So there are a few varieties across the country uh, we were, we have identified, and there is one uh, University of Agricultural Sciences, Darwad. They are doing a lot of research on cotton, where you know uh, it is internally being used. I I've been and now we are in the process. We are trying to ask so that we can grow. So one thing is making the indigenous variety, at least you know, bring them back. Mm. So we save the soil, the craftsmen. A village will be engaged in work. The next thing. Uh, is the craft of spinning, that is the pre-spinning and the spinning and the typical hand loom made of indigenous method and preserving. I don't know this will be possible in a pop, you know, for a larger scale, but at least for the saving heritage, this is this has to be done. This is the need of the hour. And uh, yes, so uh, uh, Danisha, right? Yeah, Danisha is there. Danisha, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have any question, please. You can ask directly if you want any more elaborate. Yeah, so I just wanted to know that what we can do as people to preserve. You've said all the technical stuff. So I do not come from the textile background. But I just want to know how we can be a part of it wherein we can invest something to which at least 1% can be done. So is there any way that we can help you to preserve something that is like being lost, as you're saying? One thing what I have been lately thinking is uh, uh, is coming out, you know, uh, uh, like you, I have showed you two archival collections. You know, one is uh, the Watson volume, one is the Thomas Waddle uh, report on dyes and tans of India. See, these have survived for ages. And I think the need of the hour immediately is to be done with this, which I am working on. But like and uh, you know that is pre preserving in an archival format. That is one thing. And the next thing is you can adopt a loom in the village. That is the best thing one could do. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have another question from Juliana Saf. She's asking, do you have any publication publications reporting these techniques that she can refer to, or any references on Indian yellow? Indian yellow. Okay, Indian yellow, I could say at least in South, what uh, majorly we have been using. One is the, the urine of the cow. With a, a, a cows are fed with uh, mango leaves. 
and the uh, uh, the urine is collected and it is put in a pot and you know the sediment is is been used and the cow dies at a very uh, you know uh, very soon because uh, the there's some kind of toxin that is there in the mango leaf which doesn't goes well with their digestive system the next one is the uh, the kadikai or the myrobella yellow the next one is the pomegranate rind and uh, of course the major turmeric and turmeric and uh, you know all these yellow is fugitive and uh, uh, but it's yeah but the yellow from the uh, the cow's urine is supposed said to be superior they had to do an analysis on you know the fastness and uh, the property of these colors or yellow i hadn't presented because uh, i haven't taken the work on that and uh, yeah that, that is it yeah in south i just spoke about the south okay he, he, she wants to know if there are any publications uh, reporting the techniques that you had mentioned um technique of what in the talk do you have publications uh, this is my research journey so i have put things together in my like uh, uh, my journey started 2000 and uh, till date everything i have put together and i have compressed it and i presented so whatever you want to know in a particular area this is multiple area you know one i started with the red and blue was living so i didn't really didn't care much about it but uh, that also we have uh, started doing some scientific analysis probably next year by now we'll be ready to share the results and uh, you know what we are doing and right now i am at, not at the liberty of discussing that but yes the blue also there's something happening and about the cotton yes this is again i you know a lot of questions happen and suddenly you get an opportunity and you start working on it so that is also cotton is also is a area which i'm still working on and it, there is a long way to go and anybody is interested would like to take it from you know any information i'll be have more than happy to share and all you have to do is acknowledge kalakshetra foundation okay thank you the other question is what test for use to identify the red dyes uh hplc okay uh, or what high liquid perform what what chromatography liquid chromatography oh, high okay. performance liquid chromatography yeah you're right you see i'm not a chem i'm uh, pardon me for that i have my results so anybody wants i can share it you know purely for research purpose nothing okay. else because these are unpublished articles we this this was done for a when i was there in acm we did it for um, or for a publication unfortunately that didn't happen so this is all unpublished material what i presented today okay thank you dipali does that answer your question Yes, yes. I was just one. Okay. Anything to add, Dipali? I think yours is muted again. You, we can't hear you. No, I wanted to ask one thing that um, uh, you know the five plants, red dye pl yielding plants that were mentioned. Mm -hmm. are they all yielding the same pigment or are they different are they yielding the same dye pigment or are they different uh no they they are different a uh, few uh pu purin one is alizarin yeah the chemical component dye yielding component Slightly. is different. yeah yeah it is thank you thank you so much yeah, yeah. thank you uh is there the next question is is there any evidence of textiles used for royal tents what uh, no 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 probably from the deccan region i haven't done much research on that uh yeah i didn't get an opportunity rather i have to put it that way so no okay. i don't yeah. okay thank you and the next question is any study on the modern's used i uh, see popular modern here in south even today it is the alum that is being used okay and do different modern's affect the light fastness of the dyes differently the fastness uh, of the dye does it depend on the modern's used and if yes then uh, if you can cite some examples uh, light fastness i do not know about particularly about the light fastness of different uh, modern's because the major modern that we or i always focused was the uh, alum because red and alum was a combination that when i did the literature thing or whatever the uh, least bit that is surviving the practice the alum is the major modern that is been used on uh, for red any other uh, you know i uh, 
moderate uh, for red no i haven't tried and to answer to that the uh, light fastness the textile what i had subjected to uh, heat light uh, that is temperature and uh, the the moisture uh, accelerated weathering test uh, we the color uh, i mean the the gradation or the, the value that you give the scale, the scale of 1 to 5 it was always for it when it went you know as uh, uh, zero hours uh, four and the reading after 300 hours also it was four thank you the next question is you mentioned that the cultivation and mechanized weaving of the cotton matters in the color of the dye is it is this because of the affinity of the dye to the fibers uh, like factors like ph or the moderate use also is there a difference in how the dye attaches while dyeing fibers versus a woven textile especially in the mechanical process uh dyed fibers versus woven textiles is there a difference in how the dye attaches itself on these uh, yeah this is one study you know that's why i said in my abstract i very clearly said we often look into the natural dyes uh, you know let's say the museum collection we thought there's a popular discussion is always about the natural dyes but we never spoke about the base fabric so now my question is it does probably probably you know it has to be proven so this is a study is on it has to be proven uh, whether so any museums right now who's listening or to this presentation i think yeah, I, i urge you to look into beyond natural dyes to the base fiber also and look probably i can send the current sample that is the mechanized uh, version of uh, woven fabric dyed with natural dye that can be sent for so you can do a comparative study yeah okay May may I answer here, Padma? If you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, no, no, please, please do join. Yeah. So, uh, scientifically, if we look at it, uh, the dye attachment process should remain the same, whether we are dyeing a fiber or we are dyeing a woven fabric. But uh, what has been seen because fibers are individual, so dye uptake by individual fibers is more. It is lesser when we go on to the yarn, and then even lesser when we go on to a woven yeah. fabric. Yes. beyond that there should be much different until and unless some chemical treatments like bleaching or sizing etc have been done which yes. is done sizing is done during weaving if we and if you are not removing that starch or size from the woven fabric that definitely would have an impact on the amount of dye taken up but the chemical process should remain will remain the same whether it is a fiber or it is a fabric because chemically cotton is the same in both the forms but uh, i think the property of the fiber well, is my concern here because uh, the property you know, when you see the textile the when you process when you see some of the process or the reports that they have been given i i would like to know the person who spoke now the yeah, name dipali rastogi yeah, i am dipali rastogi uh, from lady urban college department of fabric and apparel science hello, uh, hello. Yeah, yeah, hello. it's very nice to hear you uh, dr uh yes. sister it was nice yeah, it's a very nice thing i think this is a kind of brainstorming session we we really look forward yes. to yeah and we are really open to research and please do get in touch with us and yes, this here, you know i when i read a few of the she was talking about the sizing and uh, you know when you see the historical textile the process at least the reports when i read to remove the impurities or the scouring that happens or you know desizing and then in number of washes it's not just the washing and it's the uh, the process that they will use a wooden mallet to beat it so that the fiber really i don't know what what happens when it has been uh, beaten with the wooden mallet and uh, you know probably that also enhances the intake of the dye and these are all i read it but i don't have any scientific thing so probably from Dr. Deepali, and if you have an approach, you you know your knowledge on those grounds are strong. I feel, and you know it could be a very uh, it could be a collaborative project or absolutely a, you know, research, and we'll be happy to do along with you. Yeah. So a, a very a small um, uh, information I know I am sure many of um, uh, the audience know about it. So actually, cotton fiber has a very fine layer of fat on it, wax on it. 
and this is nature's way of protecting the fiber it's a very very fine and but very uniform layer mm -hmm. so uh, during scarring you know they are removing it uh, they are not able to remove that wax completely and you, it should not be removed completely because the fiber will become very harsh mm -hmm. but it is removed so that moisture can go inside mm -hmm. the fiber mm -hmm. so only once you remove it one will be able to use any dye on the fiber otherwise pure fiber cotton fiber will be highly undyeable and wettable okay uh, thank you dipali so the question was from nikita shah so nikita just wanted to confirm is it clear can we move on uh yes thank you so much both dipali and uh, bessy sasan thank you so much okay nikita yeah you welcome Now the next question is uh, Morinda citrifolia was uh, citrifolia was extensively planted around Bharatpur, which was an important center of weaving. This is Anuradha Chaturvedi. So the question is: Is the dye still manufactured? Yeah, they do. We the tribal area, at least in Orissa, for all I know, they still use it. And in many places, in small pockets across the country, I think Morinda Al. the part that's what this al al is been popularly uh, popular dye yeah it's still being used yeah but not in south but uh, uh, from gujarat uh, from orissa you know the orissa and upward and bihar and okay. yeah okay i think uh, we don't have uh, we have a Sahitya is uh, it's a comment i think she's saying for analytical studies for the fibers in europe one of the method is surface enhanced raman raman spectroscopy mm -hmm. so if you want she's saying i can send the mail to you mm -hmm. this test which is done for mm -hmm. identification of uh, for the study of fibers that's what that's wonderful Okay, yeah, that will be Sahitya. wonderful. Yeah. So I think uh, we don't have. Okay, there's another question from Ashwarya. In fact, in weaving of Dhaka muslin, it's mm -hmm. said that there was use of combing karpas, the raw cotton. Dunkar, the upper jaw of Boli, the catfish, has been used. So similarly, as you mentioned in today's talk. Oh, So in Dhaka, she shared uh, according to the reference, but only thing they don't have the today they don't have the native variety. They lost it, and this particular fish, you know, wow, it it uh, it's a freshwater fish, and except for one fish, uh, river, uh, you know, the stretch of uh, what do you say, the uh, uh, towards Southeast Asia, except for one okay. river. this particular fish lives in every other river so every other region where the the variety of cotton had this fasciness around they had used the uh, when one is west bengal they had used this yes. jabon of the fish yeah so question is there kind of relation with the traditional techniques for weaving cotton in different parts um can you relate to the traditional techniques and the cotton wool is there a relation between the method that is used uh in this is another long you know the study meaning the evolution of the material the evolution of the mechanism and uh, prior to that uh, more or less I, of course uh, in dhaka or the bengal region erstwhile bengal region you see the finest uh, fabric that was woven so that technique was not woven in south or so i think it was very confined to that region and and this is this i'm talking from the reference or the materials that i've seen and i'm talking uh i don't have any literature reference to support this and uh, i think if, otherwise be if you at that point of time if you see in south it was majorly the plain fabric and if there were some colors that meaning plain meaning undyed if there was some color that has to come in it was mostly in silk and that was incorporated and the zari was least used and if you see the evolution of uh, you know the the sari wearing or the costumes uh, uh, i think uh, well, majorly it was plain but it was not much decorative as what you see there but there was lot of colors here 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think we don't have any other question. Any other questions, please type them in very quickly so that we can take them up. Anuradha is asking not the deck pin. Anuradha, can you unmute yourself? The question is not very clear. Yeah. Uh, to Dr. Cecil, it was really a fantastic talk. Uh, we had done some study in Burhanpur where they were, it was a very famous center which used to export textiles. It was one of the three great centers of cotton uh, dyeing and weaving. And that's almost gone now. So they said that uh, this Morinda or Al was, uh, uh, it was, the color was due to the quality of the water in the river also. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask if any sort of relate of that traditional knowledge regarding the dyeing and the quality of the water, is anything known about that? Yeah, the quality of the water, that is a popular discussion. Like I said, the Waige water had an impact on the red. So for literally the red, well, the tie dyes, the bandhanis from Gujarat, it is said it is sent here for dyeing that particular red, you know, and it was sent back. And uh, the, what, the quality of water, so when you see the cheru, the olden landia ambulata, what I was talking about, it was grown and it was imported from West Bengal and Orissa to South India, but they never did the dyeing there. So probably we have the better quality of water. So water did have an impact, but how much the study, you see, from for water quality from 200 years to now, it has changed a lot. So uh, this is one study which has not been taken up, but people are aware, you know, the quality, at, at least I am aware, the quality of water has a major impact on dye. The dyeing methods, yeah. And does any knowledge regarding this all dying, does that, uh, is that still there in the decade? Yeah, it, it's there in Orissa. They, it is, uh, you know, the court part is still uh, the uh, the court part tradition. The court part is a place, of course, it's a tradition. The tribal uh, people, they still use the Morinda for at least two years back when I went. Uh, that was a scenario, and it's small pockets across uh, Orissa, they are using it. And you mentioned about Berhampur, uh, one of the very interesting textile in the Watson volume. You see, Watson volume also is completely available online with uh, Harris uh, Art Gallery, London. Uh, so I think, you know, you have to type in the textile manufacturers of India, Harris Gallery, Harris, uh, Harris Art Gallery, and the whole uh, textile comes there. You will see one row, you know, today we see the popular Pythony technique, the, the popular term, the Python. Uh, but the similar weaving technique you see in Berhampur and even in Madras, but today it is completely gone. So yeah. that, it, you know, I don't know when it came and when it left and, and uh, or uh, I don't know, that is again a question, you know, we know from the period textile, it is there and it, was, it has happened. Yeah. Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha. Thank you, Bessie. Bessie, is it okay if we share your email ID with people? Yeah, 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 yeah. Email sure. Out there. So everyone, that's the email ID, Bessie underscore Cecil at the rate yahoo.co.in. She has offered, so please use this opportunity to get in touch with her and pick as much brain as you can. Uh, thank you everyone. Just to remind you, we are having talks from 24th of July to the 7th of August, concentrating only on textile conservation, a lot of discussion on natural dyes, vegetable dyes, dyeing techniques, preventive conservation, conservation of textiles. So that's 24th to the 7th of August. So everyone please, uh, and the timings would be at five. We are shifting the timings from next week to five. That's the confusion, Bessie, I'm sorry about that. Your next talk is at five o'clock today, which was at four. So next week, next week, oh, made everybody wait. at five. So please note that. So we'll see you all again. Thank you so much, Bessie, for a very interesting talk. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks to also Mary Neshwarya and Sushant, my backend support for the registration and the uploading of the videos. Um, thank you again. We'll meet again. Thank you, Missy. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Bessie. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.